Hello there, sorry from 17 once again. This is my Give Me God of War walkthrough. And then we're going to be moving through the next part of the game that's going to lead us to the Witch. Uh, by the way, folks, if you hear any silences, any un ungainly long silences that are unlike me, it generally means I was coughing. And I trimmed it out in post because I, uh, I have this tickly cough that keeps jumping up on me. And uh, because of the way that I record now, I can't dynamically remove it the same way I used to. Um, because it's, it's complicated and I don't really want to get into it. So you just have to suffer perhaps a second or two of silence, which some of you will be thankful for because you're wondering why this crazy English guy talks so much. But the people who come here for my uh, my unique brand of commentary uh, might be wondering why I, uh, I was quiet for those moments because uh, one of the standards that I adhere to, if you know the channel well, is I, I like to feel like I'm always conveying some kind of point or I'm always um, talking to you, um, you know, some kind of form of allocution, even if it's... Helpful, not helpful, silly, serious, whatever it is, I like to fill the the video with my insights because that's what my videos do. As we use Atreus here to climb up, and I think this is going to be some experience from touching one of those glyph walls. But before we took on the boss, I was talking about Atreus, and um, he's really good in this game, guys. He's super good. He really is. Uh, I. Story-wise, I find him kind of annoying. There's a few parts of the story where I think I think it's really hard to empathize with him. But for everything else, I think he's fine. But uh, the fact that they've tied certain dialogue options to you pressing square are a nightmare. And that every single enemy that tries to attack you, he shouts to tell you that they're attacking you, is ridiculous and should be turn-offable. And I hope that they add that because that's the first thing I would do. I cannot stand... Uh, the audio of that garbage in this game. All it does is get repetitive and annoying, and you ignore it after a while. So it's unfortunate, but it's true. But in battle, uh, Atreus is even more capable than Kratos. He is super good. Not only can you use him to shoot things and stun things, and do all kinds of crazy summons later on, but you can use him to do things that you cannot do. So for instance, elites. When you come up against an elite, it's very difficult to stun them, and to juggle them, and to launch them, and to interrupt them, because they've leveled up. One of the ways to stop them is to trip them, but tripping them is quite difficult because you have to understand the trajectory of how the axe comes back. The axe comes back on a looping hook, so you have to know to throw it to the left of anything that you want it to come back and hit, and even then the detection can miss. So tripping them conventionally with the axe can be done, and is effective, but it's got a skill ceiling, you have to learn it. However, Atreus can trip them effortlessly, if he chooses to. And he tends to do it at certain moments, he tends to favour certain uh, interactions, but one of his interactions when you're attacking an enemy, or when you're taking on a group of enemies, especially if it's stunned or flinched or, or transforming or doing something specific like an animation, he can go in there and trip them up. And if they're elites, they'll fall to the ground, and it will give you an opportunity to do a free cleave on them. And it's incredibly powerful because you can't really trip them up other than, as I mentioned. And then additionally to this, he has the ability to grab them and jump on their back and stop them from attacking and doing anything and leaves them incredibly vulnerable. And these are moves you have to buy, but these are moves you should buy because they are really useful. He can grab an enemy that you can't even stun, something that has incredible hyper armor, and he can grab them and completely immobilize them and enable you to go and then pick up an item break something, set something up, do something, whatever you need to do, he can give you the breathing room to do that. Maybe there's an archer who's causing chaos against this guy with the hammer who has incredible armor and you can't deal with it. He grabs the dude, you can throw your axe safely at the dude throwing projectiles and get rid of him. Easy peasy, right? And it gets better. When he grabs people, even if they're elites and he stuns them for you, Whatever you do to them while they're grabbed does increase damage. I did an execution as Cleave the other day to a Dark Elf who Atreus had grabbed and it took off 80% of his life. It usually takes off maybe 40. It did an incredible amount of damage to his bar. That tells me immediately that if you could control that move, it would be one of the most viable ways of succeeding on this difficulty. Because it gives you damage you do not have. And it's well worth knowing. However, it's difficult to control because Atreus only does it favouring certain moments. So you can't make him do it. 
but you can put him into situations where he might do it. And that's awesome. So read up on that upgrade to make sure you understand it fully, practice with it, get an idea of when he goes into those moments and punish them. Even if you throw the axe, it's still important because a, a, an additional thing, this is how good this is by the way guys, it gets better. As I skip through that section just there of chasing the boy, there's a massive sequence where we meet the witch just then and we mess around with the pig and we do various other things, but there's no point of it being in the walkthrough because you don't need it. Instead, here's your first encounter with nightmares, an enemy that are incredibly frustrating until you can deal with them quickly. But you can only deal with them quickly when you get stronger or when you get the Blades of Chaos. And they will do incredible damage to you as long as, as well as suicide bombing you, so just don't. This enemy is a knobhead right now. Later on, you'll welcome them because they can help you out, but at this moment in time, they're incredibly dangerous and a nuisance. But just to expound on how good Atreus' move is, how good this move is, when he grabs an enemy or an elite, or whatever it may be, it will give you the opportunity to put things on them and properties that they normally would be immune to. So you've seen it firsthand. An enemy like this guy, where I throw my axe at them and it freezes them, right? But then they level up to elite and you throw the same axe throw and it doesn't freeze them because they've got an immunity to it now, a resistance to it because they've leveled up. When he grabs them and you throw your axe, it freezes them, even if they're elite. It enables you to give them the properties that they've got that blanket immunity to. So it gives you all of this strategy that literally comes from a context sensitive action that an AI companion controls. So originally you might be thinking, oh, I'm never going to use Atreus because he's a nuisance or he doesn't help or he gets in the way or he gets me killed or whatever it is. But slowly but surely as you use him, you're going to come to realize he can give you incredible advantages if you use him. And you need to use him, guys, because he's going to help you out. Not only do the bow arrows get enemies' attention, you can get an entire mob pissed off at the kid. Terrible parenting, but they'll all go and beat him up. And you have a moment then to spam your axe, to charge something, to do something, whatever it is you need to do, you can then do. Divide and conquer. And he can give you breathing room. And breathing room in a game where the enemies are very aggressive and the groups are quite large is one of the most valuable resources you're going to use. All of this adds up to... A, a level of understanding that Atreus is the difference between doing really, really well and doing okay. And the moment you start accepting that and getting used to it, it's going to pay dividends. And the best thing that I, I would say get into the habit of doing is mirroring your R1 actions with square. Which is just a fancy way of saying, when you press R1, press square as well. Press them at, together at the same time, in the same rhythm, and get used to doing that. So that every time you're attacking, you're telling the, the kid to fire his bow. Early on, this is not going to seem like a good strategy because you're not going to have the arrows or the damage to make a difference. But later, later you're going to get the stun, you're going to get the damage, you're also going to get the quiver that's going to allow you to, to do a lot of damage. And not only will the, the extra hits from the boy add stun to your combos and make you much more lethal, but if you juggle them, they'll enable you to keep the enemy in the air and do even more damage. And as we read on that note, on that video previously, on this difficulty, you do more damage to enemies when they're in the air. So it's definitely a position you want to get enemies to. Unfortunately, on this difficulty, everything levels up really quickly, so half the time you spend is against elite enemies that cannot be juggled. But such is life, right? That's the, the combat puzzle. Getting them into a position of your power and not theirs. But that transition just puts us now to the... Uh, the Lake of the Nine, and we've done some cutscenes and some discussion, and now we've been introduced to Brock again. I've just done some upgrading at his uh, workbench. My advice is simple, guys. Pick everything that powers up strength. Do not care for defense. Do not care for vitality. You don't need it. If you can do damage, you don't need to be able to take damage. That's kind of the, uh, the philosophy that I'm using when I play. As long as I can make Kratos stronger, um, everything else doesn't matter. This might not help you, of course, play how you want to play, pick what you want to pick, but the build that I'm going for here is going to favor both runic and strength and almost nothing else. But pushing forward, we're going to come up against a new enemy now called a, a Tatsal Worm. And 
Uh, it's going to be with a revenant, so it's going to be two unique enemies at the same time, which means we need to get rid of this one. And we now have the new upgrade, which is the heavy stun, which is one of my favourite moves in the game for being uh, a bastard. And uh, we're just going to freeze her with the arrows, freeze her with the axe, and then proceed to start punching her with the spin move that should loop her. And it looks like she's sitting into the loop. Oh, I just ruined it then. Do not do what I did just then, guys. The heavy attack does not loop. It's only the light one. If you do anything else and get fancy with the combos and try to do something that looks cool, she'll run away. But if you keep spamming that first move, she'll stay in it forever for some reason. Uh, but once again, she can get out of it. She just oftentimes chooses not to. And as long as you understand that, you're fine. Everything she does is blockable. Every projectile, every swing, everything. You do not have to fear this enemy. The only time you want to fear this enemy is when it's with something that is dangerous, that can break your block. Uh, for instance, a Tatsal Worm can break your block if given the right incentive. So this guy's kind of interesting. He's like a Wraith. He's very powerful when he's in the ground, but you can use all kinds of abilities to get him out of the ground and then stop him when he's when he's on the surface. So I like to freeze him, and then I like to hit him with the charged R2, and then I like to get the axe back, I like to stun with the boy and then freeze him again and then charge R2, and that's kind of the loop that I do with this enemy. Um, and the input's simple. You want to do the charged R2, press square so that he flinches from the arrow, press triangle just after square, and then immediately throw the axe, immediately go into the spin. And if you do it correctly, you should kill him without taking any damage. But you just saw me take damage, so I have to talk about that. The Tatsal Worm has a built-in defense against any kind of mashing. If you try to wail on him, he just explodes. And it's programmed to stop you from being essentially a straight-up dark side fill. They want you to be strategic against this enemy. A way to get around it is to launch him. Launching the Tatsal Worms is incredibly powerful because they can't do anything in the air, they can't counter you. So if you are going to swing at it, always launch. Never swing with a standard move. And then once he's in the air, do whatever you want to him. But when he's underground, if you press square and the boy shoots him with an arrow, it will knock him out of the ground. If you do any move that has an impact against the ground and a shockwave, it will knock him out of the ground. If you wait for him to rush you and parry him, you will knock him out of the ground. If you do the heavy parry, you'll launch him and then you can proceed to hit him and launch him. You can even throw your axe at him in the air and get that big freeze and that big AoE and then proceed to do things from there. But uh, trust me when I say, guys, they're an awkward enemy early on, but you will not have to respect them at all with the way I'm going to show you how to fight them. And later on, you're going to fight two and three at the same time. And it might sound quite ominous early on if you're not used to them, because I remember when I first fought that creature, it gave me a rough time because I didn't really understand it. But once you figure out the weakness and how to, to take advantage of them, I'm, you're going to put them into situations where they cannot even move. We're going to just loop them, and loop them in incredibly powerful ways, so never fear those garbage enemies. Even though they're not garbage, I like them a lot. But you know what I mean, you cannot compliment your enemy, fuck that shit, we're not gladiators. Anyhow, break the pots, get the hack silver, keep on mushing, mushing forward, that's a word, moving forward. And I'll continue talking about the um, what I was doing at the blacksmith, and what I'm going to be doing at the blacksmith that you're not going to be seeing. So everything that I'm going to be favouring will be strength, get a pummel, Upgrade it as best you can with strength. This is a great opportunity, by the way, to, to move around this lake, getting as many resources as possible so that you can upgrade. That's what we're going to be doing. Uh, you got, For instance, just then, we helped a spirit in this area. We're now going to be destroying the, the statue of Thor to finish off his quest and get some cool items. Um, I'm going to be sailing through that door that I've just opened, but you're not going to see it, guys, because there's a lot of sailing in this game. And I, you're going to do enough of it yourself, you don't want to see me doing it. But that doesn't mean I haven't been doing it, trust me folks. At this point in the game, you want to go around the entire lake, exploring everywhere, getting as many resources as possible. Because if you can get any of the steels, or any of the uh, scales, it's going to enable you to get better statistics. And the more you power up your armour, the higher your overall level will be, and your overall level reflects essentially how capable you are in combat. It adds all your stats together, and it gives you an, an aggregate number. And whatever that number is, is the same number that the enemies get. So you'll notice we're coming up against level 1 and 2 enemies, sometimes level 3. Level 3 is way more dangerous than level 1 and 2. For instance, this guy's level 3. You'll notice his HP bar is not yellow or green, it's kind of an orange. 
that means he's quite tough. And now he's just gone purple because these enemies are, are quite strong here. Uh, there's also wolves, and I'm going to focus on the wolves first because they're the scary ones. The wolves are a fucking nightmare. But my level right now is probably one. And I'm under these guys, but that's just the difficulty, folks. If I was higher than them, it would 100% reflect that. I think I might be two, actually, because he went to... Uh, he went to four and it made him purple. And I think that generally means anything that's two levels above you gets a lot of really, really high properties on you. But the way that the scaling works, sorry, as I say it is the most confusing way I can. When you're higher than an enemy in number in your level, they will not have any of the awesome properties that they seem to have. So you'll notice if I were to come back here when I was level five, this guy here would probably have a green life bar, meaning that he's not really any threat to me, even though he still is because of the difficulty. It will also mean that nothing that he does will probably be unblockable or unparryable, because the game gets level in a really strange way. Anything that levels up gets access to moves that have to be parried instead of blocked, whereas when they were the previous level, the same move didn't have that property. And that's how the game works. The higher the level they are, the more they get that essentially smites your ability to fight them. And if you come up against something level 7 or 8, at this moment in time, which you can do by accident, which is just don't do it, you can't block them, you can't parry them, you do no damage to them, you can't interrupt them, and they kill you in one hit. And it's 100% the number next to their name, because it's an enemy you've seen before, it's an enemy you've fought before, and it's an enemy that if the game would let you, you'd be able to kill it, but you can't, because you have to dodge everything, and you have to do a million hits to damage it. And that doesn't mention that it can heal itself by leveling up, you might not be able to interrupt its level up when it goes and becomes an elite, so you're looking at a 10 to 20 minute fight of attrition, and it's about as fun as it sounds. So. For the purposes of this walkthrough, I'm not going to go to any area that I know has enemies higher than me, because it doesn't matter how good I am at the game, it's still fucking miserable. And it's miserable because the RPG is 100% dictating the game, rather than skill. And it's super frustrating. It shouldn't be designed that way, but it is. And it's sad. Because you should be able to go anywhere if you're good enough, but you literally can't. Because they make the enemies such a miserable encounter. And I'll never understand that. And that's one of the things that this game fails, in my opinion. It doesn't have a unifying, universal mechanic that supersedes level. It has no feature that, that equalizes you with your enemy. And a lot of other games have this. And that's why those games are better than this when it comes to combat. This game has nothing that you can do to make that battlefield even. There is no skillful action you can perform that evens the score. And there should be. Parries should ignore level, and riposte should do good damage. It's just a fundamental action game mechanic. Can you imagine if parrying in Metal Gear Revengeance, on Revengeance difficulty, did no fucking damage? What would you do? It'd be a completely different game, right? It'd be much more like what it's like on Very Hard, where you have to parry things five or six times. And that is a challenge run. People play very hard just so that they have to hit things a ton more and make the game more difficult because they love that game. Whereas in this game, it's given to you on the plate. Nobody likes that kind of design and the people who do are crazy. Look at that guy dodging the executioner's cleave because he's a higher level. And when he's purple, it means he's got some savviness. So do you notice how these moves right now are all moves you've seen before, all moves you know I can block? Now I can't. Now they're unblockable, un unparryable as well. And there's an easy way to fix this. You make it so that the parry can stop those moves. You make it so that perfect parries stop red attacks, but the timing on them is strict. But that's not how it works. Instead, you just get hit. And I don't understand why. There's so many things that they could do. Like when you parry something, it should turn off their immunities for that stun flinched opening. So when you land a parry against an enemy that's almost unkillable, you can always launch them afterwards, and then when they're launched, all of those fantastic properties that they get are gone. Even the score. Make it so that they take 50% extra damage while they're in the air, and make it so that they don't have all those crazy resistances so you can do 
frost build up, burn build up, high damage, bouncing them, stunning them. Like, make them vulnerable after you do something that requires skill. That's what good balance is. Good balance isn't making every single fucking enemy ridiculously strong and unkillable. Watch this, by the way. You see that? It is over. That's that thing I mentioned in earlier this video or last video. There are moments when you throw the axe at people, even when they're leveled up, that you get strange results. So I don't know why it did what that did, but the next time you see an enemy mantling and you throw your axe at him, you might kill him. And I don't know why. Fascinating though, because it's something else to learn, right? And there's a lot to learn with this game, because it's a very big game with a lot of mechanics. It's just unfortunately a lot of those mechanics are a lot simpler than they look and they lead into conversations that we're having right now where there should be these fundamental high level action game mechanics and they don't exist. The closest thing I've found is freezing and kicking into walls because the kicking into the walls it has shitty detection and only works on certain walls but it's a grand equalizer. When you hit that wall with that enemy it takes off a massive chunk and that's universal but the problem is you can't freeze elites unless the boy grabs them and then you're never near the wall so it's a situation you can't replicate and it's just one of those things that the more you analyze the more you see these holes and that's one of the things that definitely helps in god hand in god hand the enemies have incredible hp too and the elites in god hand have so much life when you first fight them you're hitting them for for about five minutes but it's just because you're not understanding how it works and I'm hoping that this game works the same that I'm going to understand how to damage them a lot better than I do at the moment and it's going to make it easier but I feel like this game has gone so deep in on the RPG that it really doesn't matter because it's always going to feel contrived but the way that God Hand got around it was through counter damage and it's one of the things that I wish this game had when you stun an enemy in God Hand everything that you hit them with after that does additional damage every counter hit does additional damage and these damage modifiers are very high so standard moves against the enemy don't do a lot of damage but if you time those counter punches if you time those stuns into big combos you do way more damage and it evens the odds and that's what this game needed it needed something that evens the odds and the thing that we used to do in the old games was things that stunned and things that enabled us to grab. Enemies were grabbable in the previous game and the grab was really strong. So it became a game of disabling enemies via, via grab spam or via propping them up with launchers or plume of Prometheus. And then it became about collision and things like that. Those were the grand equalizers. In this game, they're not the same. And the grab is, is really underwhelming because you can only do it every blue moon. But thank you for watching and you take care now.